Hello, welcome to the Shambles Stay at Home Festival regular now. Uh, we, we wish it didn't, it wasn't, we wish it was all over, but it's not. It's now our regular Sunday science Q&A. And uh, for those of you, if you've not joined us before, just tell you a few things about other things we're doing. In fact, tonight we're doing two, uh, we're doing another science Q&A at seven o'clock where we're just going to be talking about the pandemic and the science around that and things that you might like to know from an evidence-based perspective. Uh, we have four different people, all of whom are currently working within that uh, arena. So, uh, we've got an enormous number of questions. We'll be doing that at seven o'clock. And next week on the Stay at Home Festival, which we do every morning at 10 a.m., we have, amongst others, Tim Minchin and Russell Kane and Barbie Young and Matt Parker and lots of others. And also, another thing just to quickly mention is uh, at the bottom or somewhere at the side, probably at the bottom there, there is also a tip jar. And we are collecting money for some of the people, uh, in particular, some of the performers, some of the artists, some of the musicians who uh, basically have no work for the next four months. So we're trying to make a fund for them and also hope hopefully going to make enough as well to uh, make a fund for some of the smaller art centres in smaller communities uh, which are also possibly you know facing well a very dismal time and we want to try and make sure that they're still open when we are all free again to use them as a social hub and to go and see the artists we enjoy anyway this now is the science q and a uh, we are joined by uh, oceanographer and physicist helen chersky who is with us every single week hello helen hello and we also have uh, Chris Jackson, whose work did an incredible piece uh, in, uh, back, in uh, back in December uh, when we were doing one of our nine lessons of carols for curious people. And uh, his particular expertise is in uh, three-dimensional seismic data. And there are many questions on that. Once once we led people to, because they start off with geology and they go, just rocks and stuff. And then once you go in here, they go, okay, now I'm going to research. And, and also we have uh, author, broadcaster, presenter of Radio 4's Brilliant life scientific and uh, theoretical physicist Jim Al. Jim Al. Hello, hello, Jim. Hello, Jim. Hello, 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 Robin. Hello, Robin. Good to be here. Right, we're going to start off with a show and tell. Uh, I think today I'm going to start with because I am genuinely. I, I don't know whether this will help within. I, I, I think just to start off, Chris, it would be great to tell some of the people watching what three dimensional seismic data, what that means you're kind of involved with and engaged with. Whether that also I don't know, but let's just start off with three dimensional seismic data. What, what, what does seismic that do? Data, what, what, what does that do? So I think most simply put, three dimensional seismic imaging is essentially like X raying the Earth. So imagine you want to see what's two to three to four to tens of kilometres beneath your feet. You need some sort of tool to do that, right? And you can't drill that deep. It gets too hot. Stuff melts. Uh, we can't directly observe it. So we have to use this kind of technique which sends sound waves into the earth and reveals the structure of the rocks underneath our feet. So I use that type of data to try and look at how the earth has evolved over tens to hundreds of millions of years. So I try to peer back at ancient landscapes and seascapes and try to understand what the environments look like so since that technological oh, how much I, I know you did a series uh, two-part series about um uh, volcanoes yeah. a, a, a few years back how does that change our understanding for instance of volcanic activity so i think one challenge we have with um, active volcanoes it's very hard to see inside them or underneath them because they're dangerous or they're in dangerous places and it's very hard to see what's going on beneath them whereas what we can do with some of the technology we use is we can look at ancient volcanoes so volcanoes that are not only no longer active but they're actually kilometers beneath our feet so by looking at these inactive volcanoes and their structure we can try and better understand these active volcanoes and what they why they're behaving like they do so um we can, you know, it's this idea of uniformitarianism. It's a big geo fancy word, which means the present is the key to the past. OK, so in some ways we can use what we see now to look backwards, but we can also look at the past and, and try and look at present, the present and, future. and the future. Brilliant. So let's have your, your show and tell, which may have nothing to do with that. Well, you know, obviously we're expecting <laughs> a rock, but it might not be. You know what? I, I, I want to be anything but predictable, but I, I'm going to have to lean <laughs> down. Oh! <laughs> 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 so so this is my show and tell and and, and there's for many reasons i want to show this it's because every geologist as the cliche would dictate has a collection of rocks and i'm no different to that cliche so this is my collection of rocks and and you know every geologist should have one um 
And again, another cliche is that every single geologist on Earth knows about rocks, right? So, you know, we ask somebody about a geologist, first of all, they say time team. And then eventually they kind of realise it's not archaeology, it's geology. And then they start talking about rocks and, you know, we should be able to describe every single one of these. And we can't. And this, for me, this, this kind of jar, for me, sums up a lot about earth sciences and geology at the moment, is that it's, um, it's very broad. It's not just about rocks. It's about 3D seismic data. It's about understanding how this sandstone was deposited and where and when. It's about um, geochemistry. It's about the way the earth interacts with the atmosphere. So I think geosciences, if we call it that instead, is this incredibly broad discipline which brings together maths, physics, chemistry, biology, geography, um, you know, uh, human health, lots and lots of things are covered in geosciences. So I would like to think it's kind of captured in, um, in, this, in, this, in this jar. So that was my, that's my show and tell. And hopefully it's not one at the bottom of the jar, but uh, of the ones <laughs> available to your hand, is there anything there where you go, now this, you, you particularly enjoy the story of that rock? Yeah, you know what though, weirdly enough, like oftentimes when you're on a beach, and these are mainly rocks I've collected on holidays, right, you remember more the moments when you collected them, or where you were, rather than what, you know, I actually didn't really look at the rocks, but... Um, yeah, there's like rocks like this. This is kind of a sandstone. This is what we call a sedimentary rock. It probably has a record of being transported around in river channels 250 million years ago, I think this rock is, you know, kind of. And I always think it's amazing you get to hold a piece of Earth history that old in your hand. Um, this is a metamorphic rock. Can you hold it there, maybe. So this has kind of got uh, lots of crystals in it, very big crystals. And you can see there's these lines in it. And this is a fabric. So this rock has been strained. It's been subjected to incredible pressures and temperatures. So it has a very different history to this sandstone. And, you know, you can start to pick apart the history of our planet with just these things in our hands. And, but without really knowing the exact answers, we can do some additional analysis. Um, but that, for me, is what excites me about geosciences, is all the stories in this jar. That's what I love. I love it's not just psychology when you know you, you walk around Stoke Newington High Street and remember William Blake it's psychogeology as well you know all of those stories that are inside those things um Helen uh we I'm going to start off with a question for you before your show and tell because we've okay. never really dealt with this this is from uh I'm always worried when it's Sarah without an H because I know most people say Sarah but some people still call themselves Sarah she may well be one of both of those things she may be in a superposition of Sarah Sarah at this point she wants to know uh is my bubble physics but is but by bubble physics do you mean the physics of bubbles or physics on the edge um it's absolutely the physics of bubbles and bubbles are not just soap bubbles they are what i think of as a bubble which is the much more interesting type of bubble not that i'm biased is um a gas bubble surrounded by liquid so it's really important that a bubble isn't just the gas by itself it's the combination of gas and liquid and basically it's a gas and a liquid not mixing because they don't want to mix you know gases can dissolve in liquids but a bubble is a place where that's not happening and they're separate so the sorts of bubbles i study are the ones in the ocean um, and there's lots of different types of them there are ones that come because the ocean is super saturated so that's like when you open a bottle of lemonade and suddenly bubbles appear there was gas under pressure and it comes out so you get bubbles like that you get bubbles from breaking waves you get bubbles from uh, gas releases on shallow shelves so methane seeps that kind of thing so there are all these different places where you get bubbles in the ocean and those are normally the bubbles i study although i do have a sideline in bubble acoustics which is bubbles are really noisy they make loads of sound so i study those bubbles so i very definitely study the physics of bubbles the the, the objects rather than anything on the edge although there are quite a lot of edges involved well, like a lot of the guests that we, we have on this, I think you are a polymath scientist as well. You have your area, which is your official area of study. But when I actually look at your biography, it's kind of like it goes off in many Just different areas as well. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. which is Say. exactly what we want. No, I think it's great. That's what I love is that, you know, it's not like you go, it's just here. It's here, you know, that, that, that fascination with, with the universe. So what's your show and tell today? OK, so we had a show last week about ultraviolet light and it reminded me that I have an ultraviolet torch. And these are... Um, to be treated with some care because they produce light in a wavelength that we can't see, but they can still damage you. So we're going to be a bit, it's a bit, it's not the thing you want to use all the time. It also means you can't see when I switch it on. But the what I wanted to show you, because the first time I saw this, it was amazing because I love things that are hidden in plain sight. And uh, this is, this is my passport. And I don't know how often people look at the pages of their passports, but they've got these quite, you know, these sort of pretty pages where there's all this artwork on them. But if you take your UV torch 
and shine it at the passport, you start to see there's a whole other, there's art inside art. And you can't see this very clearly. There's a bird there. Trent, can you um, put up, so producer Trent has a photo that I sent. pages of a normal passport and it's different on every page um, but you can only see it if you have a UV torch and so I'm always impressed that when you really look at, at passports they're, they're full of beautiful detail mine's got British weather symbols on it and pictures of flowers and stuff and then there's this whole other layer which is hidden underneath and and it, it, what hap what's happening is that the UV light there's a pigment in there that takes in the UV light uh, and instead of just reflecting it back and so what goes in is the same as what comes out it converts it into a slightly lower energy form, which falls within the visible spectrum that we can see. So um, that is there all the time. If we could see in UV, we'd be able to see those patterns uh, all the time. But because we can't, that torch helps us a little bit uh, to pick them out and I them out. And I just love, I love the fact it's all hidden away. Well, it's not find that there is still going to be some kind of use for a passport uh, because it's not for <laughs> traveling anymore. Well, so yeah. uh, now, now we can find the secret still, pictures. Still <laughs> also seeing a hummingbird bird rather than dandruff on a lapel in a nightclub again another uh, uh, improvement um jim uh you I, i'm going to show, throw a question at you. one of my favorite questions i ever asked you uh, and i thought it showed the beauty of physics was uh, i was reading a book uh, about basically atomic structure and i was reading about quarks and there was a bit there where a strange quarks and i kept reading about the measurement of them and trying to understand it and i rang you up and i said so what is a strange quark and you oh, gave me a lovely. So, can you give me that? I, I don't know how well you remember the answer, but it's, it's such a <laughs> lovely moment of physics. Moment of physics. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone what, how I explain strange quarks to you. I'll, I'll, I'll have another go. So, a lot of the, the 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 properties that we ascribe to these fundamental particles, quarks, um, are not properties that mean anything to us on the everyday scale. Uh, so we know that electric charge, for example, that's something we can understand. Electrons have negative charge, um, uh, quarks have electric charge as well. But there are other properties which don't mean anything in our physical. We just have to give them a name. So that we now know there are six flavors of quarks. There's up quarks and down quarks, which make up all the, the, the stuff. They make up atoms. There are four other heavier quarks, strange, charm, uh, top and bottom strange simply means it's it, a quark has a property which we've called strangeness which simply implies that it's that type of quark so particles that are made up of strange quarks have this property called strangeness it doesn't mean they're strange in any physical this flavor of quark I, um what was it? Was it? It was Terry Pratchett, I think, in, in um, one of the the, the Discworld uh, uh, novels, talks about the different colours of magic, uh, and so there's there's um, up, down, sideways, and peppermint. <laughs> like yeah, it's it's meaningless. So strangeness is simply a word to imply that this stuff contains a strange quark. That's what I love. I love it. So what is it? Well, it's down to the level of strangeness. And what's that? We're moving on now. We are moving on. Um, what is your, uh, um, what's your show and tell, Jim? Jim? Okay, well, I've, I've, so I'm, I'm here in my study at home. And uh, so I keep various bits and bobs that uh, my wife, Julie, doesn't allow me to keep in the other parts of the house. Um, one of them <laughs> is this, he reaches back, is one of my prized possessions. So as you can probably see, this is a brain. Uh, this is, in fact, a resin replica, perfect replica, down to a tenth of a millimeter accuracy of Einstein's brain. So uh, there are only about half a dozen in, the, in existence in the world. Um, I made a documentary oh, about 17 years ago now for Channel 4 called The Riddle of Einstein's Brain, uh, in which uh, a good friend of mine, you know him, Mark Lithgow, um, a neurophysiologist at UCL, uh, we travelled across America to look for Einstein's brain because when Einstein died in 1955, the pathologist who carried out the autopsy removed his brain and kept it. He took photographs of it, and so for our documentary, we we had some computer simulation put together all the photographs, a uh, virtual model, and then create this resin replica using a technique called laser lithography. So basically, it solidifies liquid uh, resin. 
Um, so this is exactly Einstein's brain. Admittedly, this is the brain of a 76-year-old man a few hours after he died. So it's probably not exactly how it would have looked when he came up with relativity theory. But I'm actually quite um, sort of encouraged by the fact that it sort of would fit inside my head. So, you know, Einstein's brain wasn't particularly large, uh, but it's, it's lovely. And if you put it on a stand, I have a little sort of light stand underneath. I should have got that ready for you, shouldn't I? Shines the light up through it. It looks very nice and eerie for Halloween parties. It's also a, a, a great thing to show off. So, yeah, Einstein's brain. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. It's such an interest, you know, that our current level of understanding brains and able to examine them as far as we can see is at the moment we can see no difference in the brain of a genius and the brain, you know, at the, uh, maybe one day when we manage to get down to those, you know, very tiny things. But for the yeah. time being, um, we've all got we, we can at least pretend we have the same amount of potential at an early stage. Exactly. Exactly. It's all down to your choice of pruning. Halloween parties at your house, Jim, must be it's terrifying. Your house, Jim, must be terrifying. If you've got the ghosts of physicists past and their brains hanging around, that, 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 you know, is that where you have Halloween parties? Like, you know, with all the... I did have a, um, a, a thermodynamics lecturer who used to stop halfway through every lecture and tell us about different thermodynamicists, and they all committed suicide, all of them. Oh, um, yeah. But Ultimately, trying to recreate a party with all of them dead. No, you know? I, I, I only have Einstein's brain. I have to make that clear. I don't collect brains of physicists by you know as a as a hobby. <laughs> Just a couple. The, um, let's go on to the questions. We've had loads of questions. When we're going to start off uh, for you, Chris. This is a question from Jasper, who is uh, nine years old, and Jasper would like to know why do some volcanoes have big eruptions and some just bubble away forever? Um, I. It kind of relates to bubbles and gas and, and the, the way the bubbles interact with the magma, so the molten rock. So whether or not you can release that gas kind of um, in, a, in, a, in a continuous form, the volcano may bubble away like a cauldron. So you're continuously able to release that pressure that's building up inside the volcano. Um, if you have a, a condition where those bubbles are actually, um, there's more gas going into the magma, then suddenly you know, all that, all those bubbles are expanding. And if they expand very rapidly and ascend very rapidly, so they come up through the volcano very rapidly and then pop, that's the explosion. So it's all to do, largely to do with the, the gases. So how much gas you're putting in and also how much pressure you can ultimately build up inside the volcano. Um, but yeah, Jasper's right. There are different types of volcanoes and they behave very, very differently. Brilliant. Thank you for that question, Jasper. Uh, Helen, this for you, this is from Steve. Uh, and I suppose this, this is going to be one of those ones where it might be five minutes of definition before you can actually give the answer, which is what is the longest that a bubble can survive in the natural world before it goes pop? Before it goes pop? So uh, we come looking at soap bubbles and soap films or ones underwater. So soap films, um, the, thing that, the thing that kills them in the end is that that thin layer of liquid drains away so every every bubble you see every spherical floating bubble you see the liquid inside the inner and outer layers is slowly draining down to the bottom and eventually that means that somewhere near the top the inside and the outside touch and then the bubble pops so for a bubble like that i think soap bubbles last unless you do unless you cheat by adding polymers and things um the maximum length of time they could last is about 20 seconds underwater it's much more interesting because of course, if you have a bubble rising through water, some of that gas can sneak through the boundary and dissolve into the water or gases in the water can sneak back the other way and, and fill up the bubble a bit more. And so what we find is that the longest lived bubbles in the ocean are all coated. And so the way the, the longest lived bubbles, what happens is you get a breaking wave, you get loads of tiny, tiny little bubbles inside it. And, and actually, we've never found the smallest bubble in the ocean. Somebody did once describe the bubbles like the dark matter of the ocean because we know this, and then it gets down to what what your definition of a bubble, but we've never found the tiniest one. There is this debate about how small they go. But everything in the ocean is full of it, you know, organic material and tiny particles and gels and all those kind of things, and they stick on the outside of your bubble. So bubbles tend to dissolve. So as they shrink, that cage of organics and particles on the outside eventually locks up. And it seems that what happens is it forms a cage so the bubble can't shrink any further. And it will just float around like that until in a, in a random process, we think, I think, 
it suddenly collapses. And there's evidence that um, if it's put under pressure, you know, if maybe it floats down a little bit deeper in the oceans, a bit more pressure, it will then suddenly collapse. And now no one has ever measured that in the ocean. I am genuinely the person, the one person in the world who's come closest to trying to answer that question. Um, and But we have definitely seen bubbles. I have seen bubbles that have lasted for an hour and a half underwater like that um that are in that cage state where they can't escape so it varies but in theory um a bubble can definitely last we have measured i have measured bubbles that have lasted an hour and a half um and there may be longer lived ones but they have to be very small because if they're big they rise through the ocean and escape at the top but the little ones just get carried around just following along with wherever the world takes them and they're the ones that can last a really long time so probably an hour and a half you to eat an aero because i always presume <laughs> i've always imagined that you would you'd bite into it and then you think well there might just be an anomaly somewhere in here there might be some form of mint based bubble formation which there could be a paper about but you know the interesting thing about aero bubbles and i don't eat that many aeros is that the bubbles are all very very similar sizes um, and that is an interesting thing for a bubble physicist to look at when i uh, years ago i moved house and my friends brought me you know we had a party housewarming presents then they brought me all the kinds of everything that had bubbles in it champagne all the kinds of chocolate and the thing about the confectionery the sweets is that the bubbles are all very similar sizes and that looks odd to me because that is very rare in nature um but yeah, so even the bubbles in arrows are interesting. <laughs> I just imagine now your housewarming party, someone going, there's a bloke called Jim carrying a brain. He says he knows <laughs> you. Should we allow him into the party or not? Uh, so did he bring a bubble or not? And if he didn't, yeah. he was not allowed in. <laughs> um, Jim, this one, this is from, uh, well, actually, I'll start off with this one, I think from Daniel, which is, um, where is the edge of our galaxy? How do we define the edge of, of our galaxy, of our galaxy? Well, um, you would think the edge of a galaxy is defined by the outermost stars. Uh, so, you know, stars tend not to float around by themselves. They get, you know, they're formed within galaxies. So a galaxy has a higher density of stars at the centre. Uh, just There's just more matter there. There's more gravity that would have collapse dust and gas together to make stars but as you go further and further out you'll you'll get lower and lower density uh, and the stars will get fewer and further between but i guess it's a bit like um uh, a, a city like london you know what's the edge of of london you know there'll be uh, you know it gradually gets a bit more rural you'll you'll get clusters of houses fewer and fewer houses then you'll get sort of little outlines of villages which may or may not consider themselves part of london it's the same with, um, say, the Milky Way galaxy. You know, there are outer lumps of, of stars, smaller galaxies uh, that we could consider as part of our own. So really, I'd say the, the, the edge of, of, of a galaxy is where the stars extend to. But of course, we now know that most of the stuff of, of galaxies is actually dark matter, uh, invisible stuff that actually provides the gravity that holds galaxies together. And dark matter, what's called the dark matter halo, extends way beyond the the outer stars so you could also say the edge of the galaxy is as, as far out as the dark matter extends but again it slowly sort of gets less and less there's no sharp edge to it as such that makes me also wonder going to slightly smaller scale about our solar system because you know voyager when voyager was 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 trapped there, there was a point where it was like well voyager hasn't really left our solar system but it's also not you know that there, there seemed to be uh a, a, a level of, of uncertainty at what point voyager had departed from yeah again yeah again you know it depends how you want to define the edge of the solar system because if it's simply uh the the, the limit of the sun's gravity, the sun's attractive force, then of course there is no edge because gravity, the force of gravity falls away like the, with the square of the distance. You know, remember the formula from, from school, Newton's law of gravity divided by R squared. So the gravitational pull of the sun is never zero. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this inverse square law. Uh, so you could say it's the, 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 the outermost planets, but now we know there are um, you know, um, other bodies, smaller objects and dust and so on that extend way, way beyond just the, the, the orbits of the planets. So, again, it's, uh, you know, when you want to say, you know, have the Voyager spacecraft left the solar system, it's not like today it's in the solar system, tomorrow it isn't. Mm -hmm. You have to wait and say, OK, well, now 
for all practical purposes, we can say it's outside of the solar system, but it will still feel a weak gravitational pull of the sun. Brilliant. Thank you, Jim. This is uh, uh, for you, Chris. This is one from uh, this. Actually, uh, Jed, Jed's husband wants to know how the fossils get into marble and where oh. marble originally comes from. So this is quite a now in terms of our psychogeology, there's quite a narrative here. And this might be... Uh, this is some like nightmarish vision of my third year metamorphic <laughs> petrology exam. Um, Sorry, can you just give us that, that phrase again? What was metamorphic, that? Metamorphic metamorphic petrology. Because oh. marble is a metamorphosed carbonate, so a limestone that's been baked marble. So um, that's what a, that's that's what a, a marble is. So if you can see a fossil, if you can see a fossil in a in a piece of marble, it's likely a remnant that was originally in the limestone from which the marble was generated. So I don't know if I've ever seen a fossil in a piece of marble because normally you'd recrystallize the calcium carbonate. You know, you'd, you'd recrystallize the limestone into um, a different form and you'd destroy the evidence of the fossil. But um, maybe there are marbles with fossils in. I'm sure there are if, they, if they've been seen. But yeah, now if you added up all the, the, the marks I got at university for metamorphic petrology and paleontology, you'd probably get to about 30. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, well i mean i don't know you know we don't know whether because because uh jed's husband i don't actually have the name said i tried to explain it myself but rather botched it so there is a possibility <laughs> why its inability to effectively explain is uh its lack of actually occurrence uh in the natural world, world as, well. as well it could be but, it, but i could well imagine you know it's a it's a fairly if you have a fairly low grade metamorphic rock, so we have high grade metamorphic rocks, which are things which are probably more like this, which have been really baked and really, really pressured. And then ones which have been slightly baked and slightly pressured. So, you know, as you get more and more baking and squeezing, you lose more and more of the primary material or fabrics that were in the rock and the fossils. So maybe, maybe you can preserve it. I like, yeah. Well, that's it's that's what I like about science. Often there are maybes. Often there is doubt. Often there is uncertainty. There's also one other one which uh, uh, Roger would like to know. Um, in the UK, do we have any useful mineral deposits left? Left. So, you know, in terms of, yeah. So it's so uh, these. Uh, and he says, by useful, I mean financially. So this is someone, someone who's who's perhaps looking at their garden at the moment, thinking about you know how they're going to get through this <laughs> the and digging the, away yeah. with some kind of pickaxe. Post Brexit, we'll all need a, 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 a you know, we'd, we'll all need our own private mineral load in the garden um, to survive, probably. Um, are they? I guess, I guess there are some things. I mean, you know, where I'm from in the peak, I'm from Derbyshire, uh, you know, so in the Peak District, there's there's still mineral deposits there which were heavily exploited hundreds of years ago, um, but are still got, um, you know. Kind of lower grade material is still there, but you know a lot of the value of something is driven by the demand. So if demand rises, something which previously has had very little requirement and nobody's had the desire to go and obtain it suddenly becomes really desirable. So if suddenly people want, um, you know, blue john or spa minerals or or something from the Peters, then suddenly people will go and exploit that. I mean, it's. Um, yeah, so I think there probably are, but at the moment we're in a lull where a lot of the minerals we require are probably not here in abundant quantities in the UK. But then there's things like cobalt and things and all these things which are being mined to make electrical products. They're in huge demand, aren't they, to, to, to make transistors and chips. But they're just we just don't have a, a rich endowment, a rich you know um, amount of that here in the UK. So we do have a lithium mine actually because of that. So that in Cornwall, Cornwall. somebody is now mining lithium, and I think it's a, a relatively new thing, and it's because exactly of that lithium ion batteries. Yeah, so I mean it's kind of um, rich all kinds of things, but that's a relatively new use for use it. for it. No, that's true. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of probably still quite like niche and a bit artisanal, you know, like, you know, probably small quantities. But if you can shorten the supply chain from Cornwall to somewhere where you're going to then process it and then utilize it or you can make enough of it to ship it, then, yeah, everything has value. But, yeah, the lithium mines, I guess, are all around the uh, granitic bodies and the igneous granitic bodies in, in Cornwall. Um, question from Marnie for you. Uh, I remember a while ago um, that uh, Helen said in some show that cuttlefish were the best animals. Explain yourself, says Marnie. 
Um, well, I actually, cephalopods are the best animals and cuttlefish are one of the types of cephalopod. And I can talk about cephalopods for a long time, but I won't. Um, but the name cephalopod means head foot. And that's, this is a, it's a group. It's a, it's now only got four uh, branches. There's three that are all together, which is squid, octopus and cuttlefish. And then there's another one, which is sort of a slightly separate branch, which is a nautilus, which is an amazing. I've never seen one in the wild, but they're quite large uh, with these spiral shells. And the octopus, cuttlefish and squid all have either a cuttlebone on the inside or no shell at all. No, no hard parts apart from their beak. But the reason that I think cephalopods are awesome. And so cuttlefish, they all have their own brilliant things. But the best thing about them is that basically if you all these people talk about when are we going to see alien life on other planets if you want to see alien life don't bother waiting for someone to invent wormholes so that we can go to an exoplanet just go into the ocean and the octopus are the weirdest form of life that you will see so they're living they evolved for completely different physical conditions right um heavy dense medium around them their last common ancestor with us is a long long way back like sort of five or six hundred million years so they are invertebrates which means and they are mollusks so they are very you know it's very very distant connection um but they are they have independently involved intelligence an octopus for example has an independently involved they're, and they're clever if you meet them they can problem solve i've seen them play with lego occupying themselves playing with lego they're great fun and if you're diving and you meet an octopus it, it it it's more like a conversation it's looking at you as much as you're looking at it it kind of they'll they'll poke you if they're feeling brave just to, to sort of see what's going on so um so there are these intelligent inver invertebrates which just are fascinating and the cuttlefish are brilliant because of their color so they can change color in spite of being colorblind like how cool is that they change color to, to camouflage themselves against their surroundings but we can see that they've only got um one type of cone in the back of their eye they've got these w-shaped pupils now there has in the I, I once gave a cuttlefish biologist a very hard time no, in a no. car it was a half hour drive and i spent half an hour going but if they're if they're colorblind why can they match their surroundings and he was like look i don't no stop asking me the question uh, and then someone has just worked it out they do something very clever to do with the refraction of light different wavelengths so they can see in color in spite of having only one type of color receptor and just finally like the thing just because they're continually becoming more bonkers something i only found out recently is that there are a uh, squid which fly and i am not making this up uh they've got jet propulsion that's part of how they move underwater and there are species of squid that will uh jet themselves up out of the ocean and then it's not just a jump they actually have um a little they can use their mantle a little bit like a wing and it seems that they get a little bit of lift and, you know, it might only be 30 or 40 meters, but these things can fly in air. How bonkers is that? Like if you, you know, what, you don't need any other animals. Just let's have the cephalopods, right? No more looking for aliens until we've, we've met the cephalopods properly. That's what I say. Well, Marnie, I hope that's answered uh, your question. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim uh, this is from Arthur, who's seven years old. And Arthur would like to know, what does the quantum in quantum science mean? Oh, nice one, Arthur. Um, well, normally when we we use the word quantum, and of course, I mean, there's quantum wine, there's quantum shampoo, there's quantum, shampoo. there's quantum whatever. It's 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 a word that sounds sciency, uh, but we often tend to think it means something big. You know, a quantum leap in 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 a, in, in technology would suggest something really big. Actually, quantum comes from from the the, the Latin quanta means um, well, we, we think of the word quantity, right? So it just it, what we mean in physics by quantum is the smallest lump of something, the smallest possible amount of something. So when it was first developed by Max Planck uh, in 1900, he, he uh, was talking about quanta of heat radiation. When objects called black bodies give off heat, he said that heat, that um, energy comes off in lumps. And the smallest possible lump you can have is a single quantum of energy. And now when we talk about quantum mechanics, the theory of, of the very small, uh, we still refer, regard the word quantum as meaning a small thing. So Max uh, Planck's, constant, Planck's constant is a really, really tiny number. And it's a measure of just how quantum-y uh, the, the, you know, the, the phenomena are that we're studying. So quantum the quantum of something, not like you know, the James Bond quantum of solace. I'm not quite sure. Maybe they, maybe it does. 
the smallest amount of solace. I don't know, but yeah. that's what it, the smallest possible amount of solace you can have is a quantum. I always find that fascinating when you read books about the history of the understanding of quantum mechanics. And when you, you know, for, for most people, they are going to immediately think of things like Schrodinger's cat and about living in a probabilistic universe and double slit experiments. So it always feels quite odd that it starts off with a story about heat, that it starts off with, you know, black body radiation. I, I find that quite a fascinating turn of events. Yeah. I mean, in, fa in, fa uh, I mean, that's in, fa in fact, that's what we now call the old quantum theory. Quantum theory began with Max Planck and Einstein in the in the first decade of the 20th century. Quantum mechanics to a physicist means the mathematics that was developed in the mid 1920s. Um, but yeah, so before we got, to, I mean, Schrodinger's cat. He, Schrodinger came up with that um, thought experiment in the mid 1930s. When we talk about um, uh, probabilities and, and, and parallel worlds and so on, when we make measurements. That wasn't developed until the 1950s. Uh, but yeah, when, when you're taught physics, uh, quantum mechanics, at, at, at certainly at universities, even from the A-level physics now, but if you're studying physics or chemistry at university, then you, you first learn about that early quantum theory, how Max Planck said energy is lumpy, and then Einstein comes along and says all electromagnetic radiation is lumpy, light comes in, in lumps, particles, we now call photons, and it wasn't till much later that people like Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Bohr said, you know, the, the, the world of the very small is very different and you, you can't have pictures of atoms. That, that took 20 years more to, to, to develop. Yeah, I think your, your, your book on that, the big book that you did a while ago, I think it is just called Quantum. Uh, is it just called Quantum? I'm trying to remember which is, but it's, it's... A Guide for the Perplexed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. For, it's, for it's, well, I've, I've, I found that and, and Manjit Kumar's book, which is also about kind oh, yeah. of the history itself. So it's, it's about the personalities even more than, than it's uh, they're both fantastic. So I recommend both of those to uh, any of you watching this. Now, we're going to have a break so you can digest what you've heard so far about the big and the small and the in-between and the fossils you're searching for in the middle of your marble. And uh, we're then going to be back with a few more of your questions. But now we're going to go over to Geologized Theatre, who uh, write rather wonderful songs uh, about the science in the world around us and i'll just mention uh, as well just before we start uh, go over to them don't forget the tip jar at the bottom of this we are making up a fund for people who are going to be hit hardest by the fact that they have had all their their work removed and uh, also to try and make sure that we can keep things some of the smaller art centers uh, which are those community hubs for many people as well as being a place for theater and music keep them going as well so thank you very much for anything you can leave ladies and gentlemen please welcome to their front rooms and your front room hello. 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 hello 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 What's today's? What's uh, today's? What's today's uh, uh, I, know, I, know what's the, I know we've got two songs for you. So what's going to happen first? Because I, I love this fact. You know, this is this is one of the beautiful things we're seeing, which is the uh, artistic creation by people who are sometimes separated, sometimes as you know, but almost you know by hemispheres. Yes, indeed. Um, so we've we've sort of produced a video of one of our songs. We like to write songs about science. Um, we're both PhD students, and we like to sort of uh, sing about it. Um, and so we've sort of put something together in our respective houses within lockdown to, to play to you today. Yes. Brilliant. And what's the first one going to be today? So first, we're going to hear... Oh, Matthew, you... you OK, um, our first one is called Climate Crisis, a musical flyer for a climate change denier. So it's... Um... Um, sort of one of our songs, uh, more aimed sort of like at an um, adult audience, uh, all about climate change and um, sort of trying to uh, debunk some of the things that maybe some prominent uh, American politicians may have said um, about uh, the climate uh, crisis. And um, yeah, it's just hopefully a useful guide um, to sort of to give to a climate change denier. Brilliant. Well, here is uh, the, Christmas, uh, the gift. Christmas gift for many of the strange people in your family. Geologize Theatre with their climate change. Oh, yes. Weather and climate are not the same. Now that 
changed in the past, but now temperature's increasing far too fast to be due to natural cycles alone. And we've put ourselves in the danger zone. Volcanoes increase greenhouse gases before, with death and destruction, extinctions galore. Hello, welcome back. That was Geologized Theatre, and uh, we have a song from their kids' musical coming up at the end, uh, all about the dinosaurs. Uh, Jim, I'm going to go to you first of all, because this is something I know, uh, well, when I say I know nothing about, that's such an enormous uh, area that gives you no clues as what it's going to be. But um, this is from Daniel, and this is, are quantum batteries actually realistic as an idea in the future, or are they just another perpetual motion machine? Now, I know nothing about quantum batteries, so what can you tell uh, um, I mean, th there are there are certainly there's a there's a new area of physics called um, quantum information theory, quantum thermodynamics. So the idea that you can uh, uh, put an atom into what's called a superposition of two states. So so it's it's like being in two places at once, but it can have two energies at once, and and you can look at how its behavior changes over time. Um, so you can certainly, so thermodynamics means that the, it's, it's the, the, the physics of, of heat and energy and, and so on. So, so batteries would come into, into that category that, you know, something having the ability to be useful, to do useful work. Um, uh, so, you know, as a charged battery can do useful work, but a, but a dead battery can't. Well, you can now apply some of these rules of thermodynamics down at the quantum scale, down at the level of atoms. But I have to say, I'm not familiar with what a quantum battery would be. I, I mean, I mean I'm, I'll throw it out to Helen here just in case she's come across it but I I never <laughs> heard of a quite I've heard I'm of many so because I was like going another batteries. area but it turns out they're not something that I've missed out uh on they are well they're probably something Daniel's working on he's deciding whether his perpetual motion machine is gonna maybe maybe it is maybe it is I mean I I get lot I get lots of uh lots of emails from people who uh claim to have invented perpetual motion machines or who claim to have proven Einstein wrong or who claim to have solved the, the you know, the found a theory of everything. Um, it, you know, so I'll, I don't want to say that quantum batteries falls into that category, but I will be looking it up. So maybe, you know, if I look it up and I find that there's actually something really important here that I'm simply ignorant of, maybe I'll let you know, Robin, and you can maybe announce it at the next uh, for the for the next uh, podcast i don't know how many if you've read it I don't know voodoo. how many of you've read it. Voodoo Science by Robert Park, uh, which a lot of that is about kind of the reporting about perpetual motion machines and about the kind of the history of the uh, the cold fusion debacle as well. And it's it's a very interesting book looking at uh, how those things kind of get misreported and, mm. and uh, various other things. I'm going to give you an easy one because that was too hard because there's uh, uh, Kathy's, I hope it is, <laughs> Kathy's children have been watching Star Wars and they want to know uh, how can there be an explosion in space when there's no oxygen? 
Ah, well, oh. well, um, you 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 can have an explosion. Uh, you you can you can have a um, a, a chemical reaction or sort of a, a, a nuclear reaction if the conditions are right. Um, what you wouldn't have would be the equivalent of of fire that we would see on Earth, and you certainly wouldn't hear a sound. So it, the, the explosions wouldn't be the same sort of chemical reactions that we would think of as an explosion on Earth, uh, which, which does require the, the, the material to, to react with oxygen. Uh, but you can certainly imagine all sorts of chemical combinations uh, or, or, as I say, if the conditions are uh, explosion, uh, which is not at the level of chemistry, the electrons that, that uh, sit around atoms, but down at the level of the the atomic nuclei, which produces much more energy. So you can have all sorts of explosions, just not the sort that produce sort of the, 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 the fire that we'd be used to seeing on Earth. Thank you, Chris, which is uh, from Roger. And he would like to know, uh, where can the oldest rocks on Earth be found? I mean, that's an interesting thing where at what point, I suppose, in the kind of Hadean history of the Earth, you know, at, at what point do we see rocks forming? And how far back can we go in terms of, uh, of of finding those? Yeah, Bill, I guess they're billions of years old, right? Um, and I and I and I'm I'm guessing they'd probably be finding what we know as what we call the shield, so like the kind of Canadian shield and the you know African shield. So these are areas of very very old um, cratons. So within the continental plate, so you've heard of plate tectonics within these within the continents. There's these very old bodies of rock which have sort of been shuffled around through plate tectonics or even pre-plate tectonics and then have been, you know, subducted. So they've gone down where two plates have collided. They've then come up in a mountain range. They've been just stretched and then they've been squashed into a mountain range. So these rocks have normally been very, very mangled. So they're normally um, metamorphic rocks. So they've been heated and squeezed. Um, but these shield environments, you know, in central parts of Australia as well, there's these very old rock bodies. So I'm not sure exactly which which are the oldest rocks on Earth? It's a very good question. Um, it feels like the sort of a question a geologist should know the answer to. <laughs> well, you start going through that big jam jar you've got and see if you can find one of them, okay? The, um, Helen, one for you. This is uh, Marnie, who's a regular watcher, seven-year-old Marnie, nearly, eight and, nearly uh, eight, and uh and her dad, Johnny, are having an argument at the moment. And uh, their argument is about whether you could make a bulletproof vest out of liquid custard using the same theory as being able to run across custard-filled swimming pools. I say yes, and seven-year-old Marnie says her dad's stupid. So. Uh, so it's a good question. Just before we get to that, I have just looked up quantum batteries and there are a significant number of re reputable journal articles. Jim's doing the same thing about things called quantum <laughs> batteries. So they definitely exist, <laughs> at least as a theoretical construct. Anyway, custard. Um, so the, so the, the reason that for those of you that haven't spent a lot of time trying to punch custard, uh, don't it hurt? Yeah. So the idea here is that there are some uh, fluids which are known as non-Newtonian fluids where the uh, strength, the way the material behaves, uh, particularly when it comes to how rigid it is or how viscous it is, depends on how fast you try and deform it or change its shape. So if you slide it very slowly, it behaves in one way. And if you thump it, it behaves quite differently. So custard is one of those uh, ones where if you pour it slowly, uh, if it's thick custard, it will pour. But if you try and hit it, it effectively becomes a solid. So it's a very sensible thing to make a bulletproof vest out of because one of the problems with bulletproof vests, one of the many, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that specifically, is first of all that they're heavy and secondly that they're really rigid because it's like walking. I mean, imagine suits of armour from the um, 14th century, right? You don't want to be walking around in this great big heavy shell. However, if you... So this, was, this is why it's not a stupid idea. Um, if you could fill a jacket with something that behaved like custard, it would be flexible. And only when it got hit hard would it actually become rigid. And people have tried this idea. And I've actually seen one of these devices. They do exist. So I'm sorry, somebody just lost a bet there. Um, and actually, they have found that they, they can be more useful than Kevlar. And that's the claim in at least some cases. And the reason is that um, they spread the whole point of a bulletproof vest. It's not that it, it doesn't get rid of any momentum, right? The bullet hits you something, something has to carry on that way. But 
um, obviously, if the bullet punches through a very small area, it goes straight through and it causes you a lot of damage. But if it spreads all of that momentum, if it gives you the momentum spread out over a large area, then the whole thing only has to move a little way. And that is what these bulletproof vests do. They they basically take all the momentum that's in a bullet, but spread it out over the whole area of the vest. And so these vests do exist. Um, there's at least one company that calls them liquid armor. Uh, but others, there's other people, plenty of people have had this idea. And yes, so it definitely does work. They're lighter and more flexible than normal vests. I don't know what happens if they leak. I assume someone has thought about this. Um, but yes, it, it definitely works. There is something about a kind of clown car style death, isn't there, which uh, makes things. Uh, yeah, it's uh, anyway. So, Marnie, on this occasion, only on this occasion, your dad's not as stupid as you thought. On other occasions, he may well still be. Uh, the um, I was uh, sorry, just uh, we've got so many more that I want to get through. And I know we've only got five minutes left. Uh, I, I want to ask something about magnets, actually, because there's been lots of um, and this is kind of for everyone, I suppose. I don't know, because magnets are always one of those things where. Trying to explain that force seems to be, you know, very, very tricky. Uh, Mark would like to know what causes the magnetic field and what is it about the field that means it can cause certain objects to move? And how do magnets fit in with the law of the conservation of energy? And do magnets eventually stop? So there we go. That should cover the last five minutes. Before any of us try to answer this, and I think Jim is probably the one who should take it on properly, um, it is worth pointing out that there is a video of Richard, the great Richard Feynman from sometime in the 70s or 80s, I think, and somebody asks him to explain magnets. And he talks, and I've watched that he talks for seven minutes, and at the end of seven minutes he says, if you don't understand the maths, I can't tell you. Um, so, Because it is a very beautiful mathematical idea, um, but... When all of us fail in the next three minutes, I think we can all say we're not the first. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because some people say he doesn't get that quite right. The, the, the questioner was actually a, a rather wonderful filmmaker called Christopher Sykes, who also made the pleasure of finding things, things out, out and uh, a brilliant series of where uh, each uh, week a different scientist would talk about their seven ones of the world. Uh, there's a wonderful one with James Lovelock and a wonderful one with uh, Miriam Rothschild, whose uh, work on fleas is a genuine go and anyone out there, if you're looking for something to watch tonight, Miriam Rothschild talking about the jumps of fleas and how she found out all about those is a very very, very beautiful look at human curiosity. Anyway, Jim, that's enough getting you off the hook. You've Googled it oh. now. What's your magnetic answer? Okay, well, the um, you mentioned Chris uh, Sykes, the, the, the director. I actually worked with him as well about 10, 15 years ago uh, on a series in which I remember talking about um, James Clark Maxwell, a uh, great Scottish physicist, uh, because he was the person who explained re mathematically how magnets work. Because basically, we thought we talk about a, a magnet having a force, you know, pulls things towards it. It turns out that's one aspect of what we call the electromagnetic force. So, electricity and magnetism are two facets of the same physical phenomenon. Uh, and the electromagnetic force is really because a magnet is surrounded by a field, which is a um, an, a region of influence. If you want to think about electromag electromagnetism, is really light. Uh, and so a magnetic uh, field, really, you put something near a magnet, what they're doing is exchanging photons, photons of light, you know, essentially because it's photons of light energy. Um, so the, it's not really a force in, in, in the sense that, you know, is a force, pressure. It's the, the magnetic field around a magnet is a field of influence containing a, an electromagnetic field where objects placed inside it will exchange photons with the magnet. That's probably not as good as Feynman's explanation either. Oh, I did quite... a lot of the time getting away from actually explaining it. And the, there's a nice mix you can see with Insane Clown Posse as well beforehand. Uh, right. the, uh, also, Paul would just like, this is a nice simple one for you, uh, Jim. Can you just say boom, just say si boom science? Boom science. Great, that's what we needed. The uh, we'll, we'll end today. There's a, we had loads of questions. Very, very slow start, uh, but we, we end up having so many lovely questions. I apologise we haven't done quite a few on the live feed. Thank you very much, everyone who's left their comments about cuttlefish as well. Um, this is from Heather, and she just wondered when she's thinking about the way the world is sometimes and the problems within it. Uh, 
can she find solace in many worlds theory? Do you think there is solace in the idea that there may be many other hers and uh, 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 versions of her? And indeed, even if the, if the universe was infinite, I suppose we have the same thing there as well about replication. So I wonder from all of you whether, you know, a philosophical question, whether there is solace in such an idea. I would say no. <laughs> um, I don't think there's in, in knowing potentially there's an infinite number of, of, of me's doing every possible thing imaginable. I like to think that I'm, I'm you know, special in some sweet way. Uh, I, I don't think there's any solace at all in thinking there are other me's that are maybe more or less successful, happier <laughs> or sadder than me. You don't want Chris, competition oh, from sorry, himself. Him. That's, brilliant. Him. That's brilliant. He, don't, he doesn't want competition from himself. Yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> there's probably just me. There's probably just many versions of the same me. mistakes that I'm making ah. now. Is probably the is the dark room I currently sit in. I think. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting is that there are certain ideas, certain which, I ideas do, which I think do give solace. I always think the block universe idea is one which gives solace in terms of mortality and ideas like that. But maybe we'll we'll have time to deal with that next week instead. Uh, we will be back next week with uh, Helen will be here again. And uh, I think we might be going down a slightly. We, we haven't done much uh, on biology, so we may. Well, I'm not sure who our guests are going to be, but that will be up soon. Um, I will also mention, as I said, at 7 p.m. we're going to do uh, we have a, a, a Q&A based around this pandemic, about the coronavirus, about research that's going on at the moment. We have someone who's actually currently involved in. Uh, well, in fact, every single person we've got on is involved in some way in researching into this uh now and uh so i hope you can join us at 7 p.m uh, i would like to say thank you very much to chris and helen and jim and uh also thank you very much for watching as i said if you if uh, all the money we collect it does not go to us it is going towards a, a, a fund to help some of those people who even at the end of this kind of period of isolation will find themselves uh without work we're going to get that fund going and also to try and keep as i mentioned before some of the kind of art centers and places where hopefully many of you enjoy going to watch people talk or just socialising uh, to keep them going as well. So thank you very much for all your help. And uh, we're going to end with Geologize Theatre as well. And uh, I should just say, if you want to get in contact with them, they are at We Are Geologize. You will find Chris and Helen and Jim. They are also uh, all on, on Twitter and other social media places and all have very interesting feeds about lots of different ideas. Um, so uh, here are Geologize Theatre and uh, they want to know what killed the dinosaurs. I'm sure that I know that I could survive anything Hey you mammals, check out these enamels I could eat what whilst I sing Me and my mates thinking over this place Live in every ecological niche We've got big claws and terrible jaws Success you will never reach Cause this one ain't big enough for the both of us And we're trying our best to survive This one ain't big enough for the both of us Only one of us can thrive After years of evolution We always get away I got solutions, we will win the day. Predator prey. I'm a little creature, I know that I will feature in this world long after you're dead. And needless to we, I've got much smaller feet and I care less about what I'm fed. I can adapt, but you'll be trapped when you lose your habitat or home. You're too specialised, it'll lead to your demise until all that's left of you is bone. Cause there's one big enough for the both of us, and we're trying our best to survive. This one ain't big enough for the both of us, only one of us can thrive. Whilst you reign, we bide our time, but change is on its way. When you're gone, we'll reach our prime, we will win the day. No matter what you say, cause this one ain't big enough for the both of us, and we're trying our best to survive. This one ain't big enough for the both of us, only one of us can thrive. Comes a meteorite, we probably shouldn't stay. Climate's changing, I'll be alright, I'll see you in Earth.